Hello and welcome to my presentation explaining the obvious architecture. This is an introduction video, so I will explain the high-level concepts and a short demo of the example app. In a later screencast, I will explain the example app in more depth and show you what it can really do. So, obvious. Obvious is a clean architecture as defined by Uncle Bob's uh, posts on clean architecture, or at least it strives to be, and it tries to solve the essential problems with Model View Controller. Uh, Model View Controller is a good pattern, it's a useful pattern, it's a popular pattern, but it has some flaws that people seem to run into and haven't seemed to really come to grips with yet in a way that really seems to solve the problems I see with it. So, a lot of people have experienced the problem of having logic in your views. We know that uh, logic in the views is bad, it's untestable, uh, it leads people to creating things like logicless views, uh, which are fine, but a lot of times they're creating these things because MVC makes it so easy for you to just call right into the database inside your view that a lot of people seem to think that it's more convenient that way, even though that it leads to some very bad coding practices. So. Logic in the views is bad. A lot of people know and understand this, and hopefully programmers have moved past that. But then they just shovel all of, all of their code into controllers, and so you have just controllers that are filled with logic, and you have controllers that have to call other controllers in a particular sequence for a particular uh, actual uh, business use case to happen. And that's not really good either, uh, because you lose code reuse, maintainability, because that business case, those uh, use cases are locked inside of your controllers. And so one day everyone got together and said, fat controllers are bad, skinny controllers are good. All of our logic will go into the model because it's not supposed to go in the view and it's not going to go into the controller, so it must go in the model, right? Because you have three things, M, V, and C. So if V and C are out, M is where all the logic goes. So you get fat models, and fat models uh, lead to things like uh, mix-ins and modules and concerns. Those are fairly reasonable uh, if you want your app to be built around the database, as many people seem to, around an ORM like Active Record, as many people seem to. Um, but it doesn't really fix anything per se because you keep moving your logic down the tree until you don't have any other place to put it. And then when it gets to that model level, then you start spreading your models as thin as you can make them and pulling out the pieces that seem to make sense to pull out. When in reality, you could sidestep the whole process with a slightly better architecture. And so... Logic in the models, and by models, a lot of I'm using the meaning of models as models as say Rails defines them, where they are tied to a database structure, um, or a lot of ORMs use them as tied to the database structure. And so, logic in the models, where they are tied to a database, leads to things like slow tests, and slow tests suck because you won't want to run them. And no one wants to sit around waiting for a slow test suite to run, just like people don't want to sit around waiting for things to compile. If we were willing to sit around and wait for things to compile, we would not be using tools like Ruby or PHP. We would all write in C++ or Java. And if we were cool with writing a slow test suite and running that all the time, then we would just do that and everyone would be testing all the time. But people avoid tests because they're usually slow they are not much fun to maintain. They do things like they touch the database or they start up rails when you're starting your tests. And that's really not cool. So things like Rails MVC tend to lead you down all of these paths that are bad, um, but they lead you there by being really convenient and making it really fast to build things even if you're going to just have to fix them later. So it's like building a house out of cardboard. You can put up a lot of house with a lot of cheap cardboard really fast. But if a windstorm hits, you're going to be like, man, I wish we had used like wood or steel, something. And it also, the kind of ORMs that tie your database directly to your models, if you want to call them that, 
is really problematic because then you don't think about what is it that your application needs as far as data and what should that look like. Instead you say, well, what does the database need? What, how should we structure the database? And structuring the database is a very important part of your application, certainly. But your object structure and your data structures don't need to be the same as your database structure. For example, you might have a blog post with tags and your tags in the database might be a join table or something. And in the active record world, maybe you'd say blog post has many tags. Um, but really, the blog post tags could just be an array of strings. They don't necessarily have to be database records. Uh, they could be stored uh, if your database wanted you to or allowed you to, they could be stored right with the blog post. They don't have to be a separate table. Uh, if you were doing a file system or a data a document oriented database, you might want to store your blog post with the tags or the comments right as part of the document. Maybe not, but the point is, is that the database is not your application. Your application is your application. And if you decide to change databases or change the way that you want to access the database or change database libraries at any given point, having the database so tied up into the models of your application is not awesome. Um, and it makes it so that you don't even have the option to switch because the cost of switching is too high. And in the same way, uh, a lot of developers uh, think that if their database is their application, that Rails is their application, that their application is a Rails app, and that Rails is what makes their application interesting, unique, and special. But if everyone's writing a Rails app, and that you think of your application as a Rails app, then is everyone really writing the same application? Well, of course not. Rails is just a framework. But the framework that you use is not the most important or interesting part of your application at all. It's just a tool. It's a framework. It should get out of the way. And so considering all of these problems that seem to face many, many, many developers, I've came up with a concept I call the obvious architecture. And isn't it obvious, the solution? Okay, not my best joke, but we'll work on it. So you can get information about obvious at obvious.retromoca.com. Um, so what Obvious does is it makes test-driven development easy, or easier. It makes apps easier to understand. It uh, reduces the framework um, database switching costs. So the idea is with Obvious, your delivery mechanism like Rails, your web framework, and your database are pulled away from your application so that your application can stand alone. It can live as a gem. You can uh, plug it together however you want. And if you want to switch out Rails for Sinatra, if you want to switch out MySQL for Mongo, uh, that should not be a big, complicated thing to do. It should actually be really easy. And um, making apps easier to understand by pulling out the application into a separate thing, you can focus just on the app. You don't have to think about what Rails is doing, where your models, views, controllers are at. You can say, OK, my app is really a collection of actions and a collection of things. So you have a collection of entities and you have a collection of actions. And that's really what defines your application. When possible, Obvious tries to optimize for maintenance. Apps tend to live longer than we ever think that they would. And maintenance is where most of the effort is going to be spent in development in one form or another, whether it's uh, adding new features or fixing bugs you don't often get to do a whole lot of greenfield development on an existing application. So making it easy to maintain is probably more beneficial than making it just really fast to get going and to build the simplest thing. And then one of the ideas that you'll find throughout Obvious is the idea of Yagni or you're not going to, you ain't going to need it or uh, there's not really a good acronym for it, but you probably don't want it is another way to sort of think about it, but it's the idea of having the smallest surface area that you should only build the minimum amount of things required to have your application work. So a lot of times uh, developers like to gold plate things, they like really fancy ways to query data and all these things, and sometimes they're necessary, but a lot of times they're not. And the most important reason Obvious was created is because it doesn't, it didn't exist, so we just had to build it. So 
uh, looks like this. Your uh, app is where the actions, uh, things that do things, and entities, uh, things that contain things, and contracts, which allow for data to be pluggable in your system. That's your app. Your delivery mechanism is like a Rails app, an API app, command line app is separate from the, your actual app that does things. So the delivery mechanism, mechanism is the integration point between the app and the external data sources. And your external data sources are defined by jacks and plugs. So a jack is essentially a data router, and a jack can have many plugs. And plugs are things that talk to like your file system or your database like Mongo, MySQL, and so forth. So app. This is what defines your application. It's what makes it interesting. It's what it does. So an app is defined by three things. You have entities, which are like models without uh, the ORM attached to it. Um, they're just simple objects. They're data structures, if you will. Um, they have very few methods. They don't necessarily do a lot. Actions are single method use case objects. And what makes these interesting is that instead of having, say, a service container with a bunch of different methods inside, you have a obviously named action with one method inside. And the benefit of that is that when you look at the app actions directory, you can see just a list of actions. So in a blog app, you might have like list posts, get categories, get users, those kinds of things. And then last, you have contracts. And contracts define validation rules for external data, external data interfaces. Essentially, contracts end up wrapping your jacks and plugs. And so when data comes into a contract and goes out of a contract, it's validated. And you define that validation. And with the kind of standard input-output mechanism, you can have the data sources be entirely pluggable, which is really cool. So external, this is what communicates with external data services. Uh, there are two types of external things, jacks, which are data routers. Uh, a jack can have many plugs. Um, so you, jacks are designed to have plugs just plugged right into them. And then you have plugs, and plugs are the things that actually talk to data sources. So if you wanted to use an ORM, you would use an ORM via a plug. If you don't, you can use something more direct like uh, the SQL gem or the Moped gem for MongoDB, something like that. Um, or you can write your own direct uh, queries to whatever data source that you want. And they don't have to be databases. These can be used for things like queues, caching, external APIs, you name it. And the delivery mechanism. So the delivery mechanism is how the user interacts with your app. It's what gets the input from the user and shows the user the output. Uh, so like a Rails app would be a delivery mechanism. Sinatra app, API app, command line app, desktop app. Uh, what's interesting is with uh, the obvious structure, it would be possible, if maybe a little weird, to pull your entire app folder into a Android app or an iPhone app using a tool like Ruboto or RubyMotion uh, because your app is not really tied to something like Rails and so if you wanted to you could plug it right in and still have the same sort of uh, actions and APIs and validations and things like that right there in your Android or iPhone apps uh, to get going um, long term, might not want to stay there forever, but if you say, hey, I've got an app working over here that's a web app and I just want to have a native interface for it, that might be a really great way to go.